Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our bi-weekly Thursday series, Ask the Howlers. I just wanted to thank everybody for all the feedback on our last two sessions. Um, you know, we covered enterprise resiliency, secure work from home. We're going to make a couple of changes. Um, uh, we're we're going to uh, do these more frequently and in a shorter format, which was some of the feedback that we heard. This session will be recorded. Um, any of the attendees will get an email along with any of the show notes, any of the links to news articles that we're going to be discussing today. As always, we're the Howlers. The Howlers are made up of a diverse group of individuals here at VMware Carbon Black. We span from engineering, sales engineering, threat research, and more to support organizations within various verticals with our security expertise. And I am very happy to uh, be a co-founding member of the Howlers. And then of course, I think a lot of us know who we are in the community and what we're about. And what we're really about um, is hopefully making defenders' lives easier because all of us came from the defensive side of the equation um, and that job becomes painful. Uh, I think a big part of our role here at Carbon Black is to make sure that um, we can do things faster with better outcomes. So with that, um, I wanted to talk about uh, who's on today's webinar, and it is it is my pleasure. I'm very excited today. Uh, not only peers, not only folks that uh, I talk to to seek their infosec wisdom, uh, but people that I consider friends. Um, Fuli Chavez uh, over at Albertsons, um, we met. Uh, gosh, I think I think I met you and Vince at the same time. I was doing a talk out at the Boise ISSA um, with which Vince runs. Um, Jason Mady. Uh, uh, one of our security strategists was like, you absolutely have to meet these two people. Uh, and he was 100% right. And I think the last time we were all together in person was at uh, Black Hat last year. So with that, uh, we're going to go around for introduces, uh, introduction. So Fuli, want to talk a little bit about um, who you are, what you're up to? Sure, no problem. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, so, yeah, um, I'm uh, currently a uh, senior information security engineer um, at Albertsons Companies. Um, been over um, in the IT security um, um, for about 20 years, and uh, been doing done a lot of work in different verticals, everything from uh, post -ed secondary education to financial services, and now retail. Been in Albertsons for a little bit over a year. And uh, it's uh, definitely uh, great to be part of the community. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for um, taking some time out of schedule because I know I know you're busy as well. Um, also, my good pleasure to introduce Vince. Uh, I think you should know who Vince is. Like I, I just always say that Vince and Fooley, um, I think are, are infosec realists. Um, it's why I like them so much. Uh, they got a lot of seat time and then a lot of advisory time. Um, Vince, you want to talk a little bit about, because uh, I know you transitioned not too long ago, uh, your new role and what you're up to, and uh, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so I work for Milton Security uh, as their VP of Integration and Deployment uh, in uh, Layman Speak. Uh, we uh, work, I'm, I'm the, the glue between the customer and sales and uh, the technical staff and platform engineering to to onboard customers and to consult with the customers to make sure that uh, they're um, getting the correct logs, verbosity, and um, solutions to protect their environments. So, fun stuff. Always a, a new, new solution, uh, new things to learn about. So, good things. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for uh, making some time for us. And uh, always my pleasure to be on with Jason Mady, uh, one of my good friends, uh, one of the howlers uh, here at VMware Carbon Black. And I, I just can't say enough about, um, he's seemingly everywhere. Like every time I'm like, uh, what? How is Jason uh, in another region doing some cool things? But Jason, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Jason Mady. I'm security strategist here at Carbon Black uh, VMware. I'm super excited to talk with everybody today and obviously have a com uh, conversation with Fully, Vince, and Rick. Um, I've been uh, in the industry for a little under 10 years, uh, four and a half on the vendor side. Before that, worked for MSSPs, did security in both uh, private and public sector. And uh, while I'm, I think I'm, I'm kind of the, uh, the the young gun here amongst these gentlemen, um, you know, one beautiful thing about, you know, the, the way, the places my career has taken me is that I've been able to surround myself with guys like Fooley, Vince, and Rick and just learn a ton. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This is going to be great. 
Awesome. Yeah. And as always, I'm Rick McElroy, uh, Principal Cybersecurity Strategist for VMware Carbon Black. And today I'm actually pinch hitting uh, for, for the awesome uh, Ryan Murphy. So uh, if this if this webinar goes poorly, you can blame me as the host. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just let Ryan know that he has to uh, not take any PTO days and cover all of it. Um, gentlemen, you know, one of the things that I saw um, over the last week is that, um, you know, I'm always always looking for articles and things that I think are going to change uh, InfoSec that we don't control, right? And, and there's tons of them. Those could be regulations, could be laws, um, it could be insurance company mandates, uh, and it could also be current uh, the uh, current cases, right? So the one that I want to talk about um, is, is Capital One, right? So so the lawsuit for Capital One is is actively occurring as we speak. Um, but one of the interesting things that came out of um, this lawsuit is that the judge is now mandating that Capital One has to turn over the Mandiant breach report, which has never actually happened, right? It's typically considered um, private information that does not uh, need to be released. In this particular case, um, I think a new precedent is being set. Um, but I'll start with um, Fooley. Like, like as you're looking at this, right? So, so I imagine um, for Albertsons or any other organizations out there, like, yeah, breaches are gonna happen. Right. Um, uh, you know, I don't think Carbon Black or VMware is a company that says uh, VMware uh, or uh, breaches are going to stop 100 percent of the time. So we know things are going to happen. We know we should have IR teams on retainers. Um, we know those teams are going to deploy tools. Um, they're going to identify material weaknesses in our programs, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but what is your thoughts on um, sort of uh, uh, the rescoping of information that we have to give over to to lawsuits? Well, Rick, um, it's a very interesting question, and uh, I, I, this particular case that you know you've uh, uh, brought up is definitely going to be a game changer for all of us. Um, I think we need to work with our legal teams as corporations, uh, especially you know if we're talking about <clears throat> corporations that are large and well and distributed across you know multiple states, because um, you know that president will. Uh, be uh, pulled out at at a state level initially, and <clears throat> we'll need to go back to the drawing board and identify how we are going to do these contractual uh, obligations that are really our uh, <clears throat> standard operating procedures and best practices. Because now we're we're going to be held liable um, to potentially being able, be, having to disclose that information, uh, which before was just something that we were doing. So now, anytime that uh, the legal uh, bodies get involved, you know, it makes things that you have to be proactive to understand how that information is going to be the first requested and then. Make Yeah, great. And Vince, I mean, I know uh, over on the Milton side, right? So you guys are doing uh, MDR. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, and I think this is true, that you guys interact with law enforcement in some cases, and uh, you know, you guys actually do some of that IR stuff uh, as well. Um, sort of, what what's your perspective on that, right? So former CISO, now you're over at a vendor providing um, these services. You know, uh, sort of, what what's your take? What, what's your take on um, on this kind of new precedent that's been set? Yeah, uh, it's, it's funny that uh, this uh, precedent uh, fully and and a number of colleagues that uh, and friends that we we get together with we're talking about this not not necessarily this but the idea of precedent and how impactful it is. Uh, this will will pardon the pun set a precedent to legal teams uh, within large companies to um, make some serious changes, and not only of what is being done, but then what is the report. Um, and I know even, you know, in talking with another one of my other colleagues that does a, a lot of computer forensics, uh, there's a lot of companies out there that don't want to get an assessment done because of the legal ramifications <laughs> and now I have to do something um, so there's that I think it, it, it might make a big impact to legal teams and especially to pen tests what what is given out after the pen test the outputs of that 
um, and assessments in general. Vince, that's interesting. Like, like potential blowback is we just don't do that service because then <laughs> we're not liable because we didn't know, right? Which is, uh, and you guys have all been around long enough, which is like kind of what we did in like 99 and 2000. Like there, there was a lot, you know, we're not doing a pen test because, because if we don't know what the holes are, then, you know, right. And it, um, I think it bums me out in a way. Right. And, and Jason, I'll, I'll, I'll pose this one to you. What it, what I am hopeful of is that, um, as we've gone through these mega breaches, um, customers have gotten smarter about, um, how cybersecurity works. Uh, I'm hopeful, like, like I like transparency. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like, uh, of course, uh, if I want to understand as a consumer what happened, like I want to see all that data, but, but at the same time too, then it's public record, right? Then you have your material deficiencies that attackers can see. And, and, and so um, tra transparency, in my humble opinion, um, especially when it relates to keeping confidentiality is tough, right? Um, so yeah. Jason, I, I, I know um, you handle a lot of uh, organizations that um, have had high profile breaches and, and certainly um, have sort of uh, uh, bear the burden of, of, of some of these APT actors and, and these continual attacks, right? But I mean, what are you hearing from the customer base on this? Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, so yeah, I, I work with a lot of very large enterprise customers. Uh, you know, you'd recognize a lot of their names from uh, the headlines of the past two years. And uh, quite frankly, they're all really freaked out for really exactly what you just said there, Rick. You know, confidentiality in this business is incredibly important because as soon as that stuff gets out, especially too quickly, all of a sudden you're exposed, and now it's a feeding frenzy. Every APT you know group on the planet is going to go after it with the data that they've got um, to try to get in. Um, so I think that what really ultimately needs to happen is uh, we do need greater transparency, but we need to have time limits set. And there also need to be some objectives tied to that time limit so that these people have the appropriate amount of time to remedy, fix, re-architect, whatever it might be that is ultimately going to be you know, blown up in a report like that. And it probably needs to be redacted to some extent as well. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if we have some sort of process in place to um, uh, 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 bring transparency without complete exposure, the overall community is going to end up in a much better place. Um, it's going to make, uh, you know, those guys kind of, you know, Vince, what you were saying, just, oh, uh, yeah, you know, now we have to do something. Well, you know what? Now you do have to do something. Um, or else there's going to be heavy ramifications for that on a multitude of levels. So I think it's a kind of an eye-opening event that's occurring. Um, but as far as, you know, getting data out there and getting the report out there, there needs to be some leashes around that because, uh, again, we can open up a huge attack surface that could just bring out a wall of problems uh, for the unsuspecting here. Yeah, I mean, I just think about, like, our IR partners and the amount of data. And, you know, I know uh, in my case, I was asked to, to unencrypt tons of encrypted data to send off to um to attorney generals you know depending on the state and even their methods for transfer were terrible like like in one case they lost an unencrypted hard drive and it was just okay and then i was like how is that okay if if we're the shepherds of this data and, and providing security right so i even think you know hey it would be great if this as an example the state of california had a um a singular method for encryption and decryptions on uh, sent, sending in information that had to go to courts because it's because it's just a mess. And then uh, and then of course we've already seen attacks on law firms where that data is sitting, right? And then it's all unencrypted now and it's open. And um, yeah, so so I think to your point, Jason, um, I'm a fan, but I think we got to put it on the right rails and and ensure those transfers are are done in a way um, that keeps people protected in the end, right? Yep. All right, I think we beat that one close enough to death uh, for a while. We're absolutely going to follow up on this um, as as more um, more news comes out. But um, let's pivot to question two, right? So, um, uh, in some ways, COVID is still the center of attention in today's world. In some ways, um, I, I feels like uh, people are just over it, right? But uh, you know, so so this 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 general uh, increase in work for a couple of weeks, two, three weeks to scramble to adopt um, work from home models for organizations that haven't. Um, you know, we see lots of talk about um, zero trust models. I think there was a good article in Dark Reading um, that, that and the title of the article is like, zero trust is the best answer to COVID-19 lockdown. Um, I, I guess in theory, I agree with that. Um, I, I think it's a good starting point to, to talk about the COVID related issues and the security issues that uh, are, are impacted when you have a bunch of people that 
Um, as an example, I broke my entire NAC model and they used to sit in an office and that office was wired to, to access certain assets and, and now it's not, right? Uh, so all, all that being said, uh, let, let's talk about, uh, and, and I'm going to start with Vince on this one. Um, so, so what have you seen from your customer base? Because uh, I know who your customer base are, right? So you're handling a lot of uh, medium-sized customers, some enterprise customers. Um, so, so this initial like uplift in work, and then does it hold true that um, sending, or, or at least from the data that you have, sending people home has increased our risk or, or we've seen more breaches as a result? Yeah, on the on the breaches, that's um, something else. I haven't. I don't think we have enough data and enough time that has transpired to to see that. But um, Foley and I have had a lot of experience with um, trying to find a model in the past uh, for the remote worker that uh, works. Uh, and it, you know, the model that we came up with, I think, was very effective. Uh, could it be improved? Yes, most definitely. Um, I think there's a lot of um, different methods that I've seen. I mean, give you a good example. I mean, my, my girlfriend works for a uh, insurance agency, and they have her working from home, and um, it's all um, thin top clients. So the 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 uh, zero client or whatever you want to call it, uh, small OS, uh, phones back. And then it's almost like a Citrix session of sorts. And same thing with the phone, and um, you know, and, the, and that's PHI data. So I think that's one of the big ones, big aspects. But then there's others. Is that okay? Well, do they have a printer? Um, you know, and, and all of the the types of data that that they deal with, and where is that stored, and things like that. So I get, it, it depending on the model that is implemented, um, there's different concerns or gaps that still exist um, especially around you know that device that's in their home or devices I should say that are that's in their home uh, are there mechanisms that data could be either lost pilfered um, could someone steal it um, those type of of things so yeah and if you want to want fully and I to go into kind of some of the the details of uh, some of the gaps but also some of the things to consider it's pretty interesting yeah I, I know we've talked about like doing a follow-up blog I, I actually think that's an excellent topic and 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 fully right so so I mean you're part of an organization you probably had um, some constituents in your organization that were already working remote like typically IT you know has access IT security um, so some of the executives always have remote access right so so I mean you know, you're you're in the seat making making the calls, um, kind of during this crisis. Uh, yeah. So 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 from your opinion, right? Like, uh, have you lost capabilities that you that you feel like? Because because I know uh, a lot of the things I hear are around visibility, right? So hey, I used to have network visibility. Now people are connecting with home routers that I'm assuming are are already subverted. Uh, so hey, strong VPN, all that good stuff. But but from your perspective, sort sort of working through it, right? Um, I agree with, I, you know, at least um, on the surface, like Vince's architecture, I think that's a, a, a fine architecture to look at. But, but from your perspective, you know, what challenges have been raised uh, on the InfoSec team itself? Well, I think we're, we're in the same boat as all companies, right? Because we uh, have been going over the last, you know, five years, ten years uh, with being able to switch over to not just internal um, data centers, we're going, you know, everybody has adopted that cloud, uh, the, the, the cloud and utilizes now web applications that are, can be accessed from anywhere. Um, and they're going on a, uh, completely separate connect communication link than that you have internally. So before, you know, you had some, um, <clears throat> you, you had your internal, um, uh, security methods that uh, could be used to enhance that security because if you are talking to uh, a website, let's say it's uh, um, Google Docs or uh, Microsoft uh, Office 365, um, you could have additional 
uh, controls within the endpoints within your local system, as well as the additional visibility. So, but now shifting from a work from home, if you limit everything to go through the VPNs, you're gonna be increasing your bottlenecks um, in terms of you know what is gonna be the experience to the user. So depending on your company, do you have CASB uh, configured so that you can um, monitor the, that information flow directly through the external connections, uh, as opposed to having that, um, you know, that secondary or third, tertiary layers within the internal network. Um, and that is really dependent on where you were as a company, um, you know, uh, from evolving into being able to support that. Um, I think more, uh, most of the companies that have been working and dealing with this in the last couple of years really have had their, their, um, uh, their configurations fairly well tuned. So it was a matter of just being able to figure out, okay, um, do we want to allow that BYOD or is it going to be strictly, um, machines that we have control over so we have at least a minimal amount of standards that are adhering to so that somebody doesn't get like a, um, a hijack on their web browser um, because they know that at least you have AV or next gen AV, whatever it might be, uh, to be able to de detect those methods. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, one of the, I think, um, big, big trends that'll come out is like cloud security, cloud security, cloud security. And even when I think about just like, a web proxy, um, you know, content filtering. It's like, why am I going to go manage those devices? Here, here, here's a DAT file that, that I throw out to your system. Now I have DLP wherever you go, right? Um, J Jason, uh, kind of pulling this thread as well, right? So um, I think we've all heard about, uh, you know, this giant rise in CDC fake domains that are being built and, and Zoom domains that are being built and, uh, you know, sort of, sort of all of this phishing stuff. But, but I mean, what else are we seeing out there um, from from the adversaries trying to take advantage of people who are now working remote. Yeah, so I think there's a couple different angles to to take a look at that, uh, right? So it's both on the you know the end user side as well as the corporate side, um, because you know while a lot of organizations were adequately prepped or you know at least you know 75% of the way there <clears throat> to make this very quick traffic drastic pivot over to this work from home model, um, and to, you know instituting secure connections whether it's VPN or a uh, some sort of, you know, uh, you know, Okta single sign on sort of solution, um, a lot of them weren't. And uh, what we've seen as well is that these places are now doing business at a reduced capacity. There's employees getting furloughed. Those that are left now have even more on their plate that they already did. We've got an employment issue in the, you know, security uh, 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 industry as a, uh, already. But now these guys are extra strained. They're under the gun and they need to start to build out these configurations, make system changes, maybe adopt new systems that they haven't been adequately trained on. And attackers are one, recognizing that and they're going to prey on that and they're going to target and they're going to probe all of these new systems and things that are coming up in order to accommodate this new work from home culture that we have. But because of that increased load, you're going to see increased mistakes, configuration errors, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to prey on that. And then when we switch over to the end user side, all of a sudden, the person who you know went to their office building and sat behind a computer nine to five and then left and never did any work at home is now possibly using their own personal device because that current organization, which is now under budgetary strain, either uh, you know can't afford laptops or they can't afford thin clients or they uh, uh, or they just simply can't get them because there's a shortage. Um, uh, uh, that leaves a compromised, potentially compromised, unmanaged device out there. But then more importantly is that we're in incredibly uncertain times right now. And these people that are new to working from home, um, they are already freaked out. They're already scared. Job insecurity, um, you know, this is a new experience, not going to my nine to five, sitting behind my desk, and attackers are preying on that. They're going to use COVID-related, you know, phishing scams to get after them. They're going to go ahead and um, uh, uh, do things of that nature. You know, I read an article where Microsoft discovered uh, um, a phishing campaign. It had 2,300 web pages built out um, uh, 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 with a phishing uh, message saying, "Hey, financial compensation for COVID." You know, again, people are scared and they're preying on that and they're being successful with it. You know, they're going to always look for the path of least resistance. And right now. COVID uh, uh, fear is exactly that, and it's happening on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, I think, you, dude, you hit on something interesting, which is like people would go into work and put on a work hat, 
and uh, you know uh, events. You know, fully, you you've all created policies and standards and and security education and awareness training and all the good stuff. But but like yeah, like like if I work a job, like you go in and I'm like I'm on the job, and then I go home and I'm not on the job, and this this sort of um, blending of uh, at work, not at work. Um, at home, not at home. Like it does lend itself to to I think just not having that mindset and being and being mindful about things. And I think the other thing I think about um, is, is just our communication modalities of change. So maybe Vince and I, uh, or or Fooley and I, would get on a whiteboard and talk about um, our security stack and um, improving that, right? And uh, but it's in a closed room and it's just us. Well, now maybe that's occurring while I'm sitting in my backyard, right? Maybe that's occurring over Slack or Zoom or, or some other new communication modality as an org I had to spin up. Um, and then I think uh, this, this one, I, I'm gonna kick back to Fooley, but the other one I, I think about too is, you know, during layoffs, during times of economic uncertainty, um, people, people have a tendency to make um, different choices and the insider threat, um, you know, of, of laying off some InfoSec people or laying off some IT people or other people in your org and then those folks leaking, leaking data. Um, is, is frankly, I, I, I think a concern for organization during these times. But I, I, I mean, fool, is, is that a con, is that a concern of yours today, or or are you guys just not going through sort of some economic hardships, right? And you, you don't you don't need to get into all the business of Albertsons, right? But right. Well, I think that as um, you know, regardless of the industry, um, having that inability to you know, work and have that direct connections, uh, especially when there's a quick and, um, you know, almost instantaneous shift, um, is, is going to put an increased risk from that potential threat. Um, you're hoping that, you know, as companies, as a company, that you treat your uh, employees fairly and well, and, you know, that way they they uh, really consider that you know additional training that they're getting as something that's impactful and, and helpful for them. So um, you know people will do what they do, but if you put them into into a position where um, you really are providing that extra care on a personal level, um, I think they'll make the the right you know the the right decisions, you know, for for them and the company. Um, nobody wants to screw their company. You know, you know, that's just kind of one of those those things that inherently it's a matter of, um, you know, if you are required to to do something like that. So putting additional checks uh, in place, I think, is uh, uh, very important. Um, you know, that that whole uh, understanding that um, locks. Um, you know, what do they do? Well, they honest people honest uh, so it's it's a matter of um, making sure that you that they understand that yeah we're uh, increasing our security methods to um, maintain uh, you safe as you work from home uh, one of the things that I would like to see more would be uh, containerized uh, systems in traditional um, uh, desktop and laptop environments uh, so that they can work uh, directly from uh, a home utilizing you know their own uh, BYOD devices um, and being able to uh, make sure that that is compartmentalized on those systems, uh, not just what we do right now with um, uh, cell phones or uh, tablets. Yeah, dude, I think you I think you nailed on it. I mean, um, obviously, I think VMware is going to find themselves um, squarely in the middle of that. But this this idea that um, future you know desktop is abstracted and it's all just containers, right? And then I, I I would agree with you. And and when when we get there, it'll be a better place, right? Um, yep. So look, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, and um, we're just going to go around the horn, right? So I'll start with Vince on this one uh, today versus um, two months ago. Let's just call it two months at this point, right? What, uh, what's changed uh, in, in regard, or has anything changed into like what keeps you up at night and what keeps you worried for your customers? Anything has changed. Um, the, the recent issues with uh, rioting and looting, um, I was actually on a call with one of my customers and uh, he had to leave. Um, because the area where the small business was located uh, was they they were they were evacuating the area the the law enforcement and everything else so um, and then also one of our 
uh, my colleagues at, at Milton, um, they had some incidences, uh, let's call them that way, uh, right next to his house um, with the writing and looting and things like that. So more of a physical security perspective, but again, it impacts how, um, you know, where you do business and, and what data is at those locations and how it could be utilized against you if, um, if that, if that was, you know, obtained by a looter or, you know, what have you. So, uh, that's probably one of the big ones. Um, the whole COVID aspect is just, uh, the biggest impact has been to give our customers help in any way that we can to help them move to the whole work at home. Uh, they were very overburdened, overworked. Um, you know, within, you know, a couple of days, it's like, hey, you need to move 3,000 employees to work from home. And, you know, where am I going to get the, the, you know, laptops or whatever, you know, the hardware that is needed for that to take place. And, um, yeah, big, big difficulties there. So those are probably the two. Um, when it comes to overall threats, um, one of the biggest ones, and we've been uh, helping uh, a lot of our customers with this, is the amount of domains that have been created and used for phishing um, attacks uh, tying back to COVID. Um, one of our uh, uh, chief technology officers, he has uh, some awesome data in regards to that of just how many how many domains have been utilized but then also what who are they tied to potential groups and then also does it affect our customers so cool cool thread intel absolutely absolutely um jason listen i you know just to pull the thread um that vince kind of talked about i mean i know you have to go board some things up in seattle right and um are, are, i mean are yeah. you seeing uh, more work, that, like I'll just call it work disruption, right? Because because obviously you know some customers can't get yeah, to the totally. the thing that they used to sell. Some customers are going to have to rebuild, right? All all, all of that good stuff. But um, yeah, it, it, has anything changed for you over the last couple of months from a, a infosec worry perspective? Um, yeah, you know what, and and really I'll, I'll put it from uh, more uh, pose it as a, you know what what I see in my customers more than anything, um, and it's really just been. Um, one, yeah, there's been a lot of physical security stuff that has altered it. Um, you know, to very similar instances that Vince brought up, um, people had to evacuate. Um, and maybe they didn't have access to uh, uh, use the application that they needed to outside of the walls of their building. Um, there's there's all sorts of that stuff going on. I've got people that I work with that are now working from their homes and they live in city centers. And, um, you know, there's things going on in the streets pretty much 24-7 in every population center. And uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a riot, people screaming outside, and, you know, even, you know, get to the more family side, right? You know, all of a sudden, the entire family's back in the house. And, uh, you know, dad's trying to do work and mom's trying to do work and they've got three kids, you know, educating via Zoom. And now all of a sudden, the distractions are just a plenty. So that certainly has derailed a lot of, I think, just overall productivity and what people can get done. But from a project perspective, what I've really seen is some very fast pivots from, hey, we're full steam ahead on this EDR project or, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever that project might be to moving around to, okay, um, now I've just been reassigned to web application firewall project. We need to get this up for these four mission critical applications in order to get this thing, uh, uh, in order uh, to keep the business moving. Um, and, and a lot of quick pivots from what they were doing um, to, hey, you know what, we need to start focusing on more COVID related uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, COVID uh, related sort of issues, not just our normal status quo. Hey, here's our project plan that we submitted at the uh, you know end of last year, so we we can work it on at the beginning of this year. So it's got everybody going in a whole bunch of new directions and facing new obstacles and different distractions that are really you know pretty much unique uh, in in the in the you know last you know 50 years of working. Yeah, I agree. The, uh, the the continual project shuffle, and then um, yeah, we we we've seen everything from money evaporate, right? Just companies asked yep. everybody oh, yeah. to take a cut. Um, yeah, so so I think the one thing I think about the most is um, taking care of our people, like and and you know that's infosec. That's the people that we work with, right? Our families, our our coworkers, and 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 just realizing that hey, we're gonna have to tuck and roll for a while. Um, and it's gonna it's gonna be weird, so we have to operate in that weirdness. Uh, but 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 fully, yeah. Um, so so what's what's keeping you up now versus you know kind of pre-COVID, or has anything changed? Uh, 
I would say that the biggest thing I, I've seen change within the uh, security area has really been, you know, that needed emphasis that for disaster recovery and business continuity. Um, it's because it just hasn't been just one locality. It's been you know, across the world. And so you know, people that have, didn't have proper, uh, you know, uh, processes in place have felt not only the hardship from not being able to work, but also, you know, the inability to adapt to what's going on right now. So, you know, there's that, uh, I think DR and business continuity is a huge emphasis that we will see rise up in the next, uh, still continually. And we seem to be, you know, going from one thing to another. We went from the COVID-19 emphasis now to, you know, rioting and uh, protests. And that all has an impact. Yes, it does. Things are moving fast. Uh, well, look, just, just to wrap up, I think, final thoughts. Um, your program's got to be, I'm going to say all the, all the buzzwords. It's got to be flexible, right? Um, it has to be resilient. That's the one thing I think about with most of the systems that have been impacted by the pandemic. It's like all, all it really did is highlight a number of areas that were just not resilient in, um, and, and have, uh, you know, our supply chain not resilient, right? Like ton, tons of that stuff. So I think um, if I had a theme for InfoSec to work on for the next three years, it would be it would be resiliency, resiliency of our orgs, resiliency of our programs, resiliency of our people. Um, and I think that'll get us to a better place. But with that, um, I'm going to wrap up by saying, um, you know, we're, we're doing these biweekly now. So in another couple Thursdays, uh, you'll see us on for the next session. Right. We're going to talk about uh, unsung heroes versus hacktivists, which is, I think is super interesting right now. We've seen a resurgence from some of the hacktivist groups um, currently, and I think that's going to continue whenever there's political unrest. Um, you'll start to see some independent groups form up and, and do some things. Uh, that'll be with myself and Tom Kellerman, which is always uh, fun and always cool to discuss. Uh, but on behalf of VMware Carm Black, on behalf of all our attendees, uh, Jason, Vince Foley, thank you guys so much for, for your time and talents. Um, and if anybody you know wants to follow up, uh, you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on LinkedIn, um, you can shoot us emails, uh, we make ourselves available. And uh, thank you so much and everybody be safe and um, yeah, be resilient. Thanks everyone.